is cooked and removed. Sorry, ma'am. Or all the dhatus are damaged and the person dies. I mean, these descriptions are there in Ayurveda. So we do according to the stages, whether you're asymptomatic, mild symptom. Uh, Ayurvedic physicians have in India also created a classification for COVID, I mean, the mm. stages. And then we have treatments according to the stages. Mm. And of course, uh, you know, supporting the body with good nutrition, rest, hydration. This is also part of the Ayurvedic treatment. Mm. Mm. Sure, sure. But uh, from my experience, early intervention with Ayurveda can seeming to seems to be helping in preventing the progress mm. of the disease to more severe stages. Because once a crisis comes in, we may need technological intervention. Mm. But I have also had experience in severe COVID patients responding to Ayurvedic treatment in ICUs. Mm. And uh, recovering, even allopathic doctors have done that. We have documented a lot of this and also published many case reports. Mm. So, mm. yeah, the Ministry of Ayush also did a lot of studies. Mm. And uh, there are some preliminary information. Definitely, it looks like, you know, because uh, we are not fighting the virus, we are basically strengthening the body's mm. own system. So, that's an old knowledge. The virus may be new, mm. but you know, our immune system, we know about it for thousands of years. Mm. So where that works, Ayurveda will work, where you cannot activate the immune system. Mm. You know, nothing seems to be working because even in modern medicine, mm. they don't have any antiviral, effective antiviral drugs mm. yet. They're also doing the same thing, the, the whole, uh, this, um, what we got, uh, the injection, it is all about uh, activating the response of the immune system to do faster. Yeah. Yeah? So they're kind of training the, the cells which would be produced faster when this uh, element will appear. That's the same story. It's the old story. But we also have to suppress the immune system when the cytokine storm comes. So they use steroids and mm. immunosuppressants. Mm. And if the timing is not proper, then, you know, it can have contradictory results. Because even in modern management in India, a lot of things were did wrong because people use antibiotics very early. Mm. And it should be used only when there is secondary infection you know, which is when COVID advances and there's pneumonia, then you need, uh, you know, antibiotics according to modern thinking. And then when the cytokine storm is impending, which you can know through some blood tests, then you have to start steroids immediately. And then you can prevent, uh, you know, the, the ARDS or that COVID crisis, which out of which is really challenging to recover. Mm. You feel so, you, you recovered from this? You don't have the kind of side effects uh, from it? Uh, yeah, all of us, uh, you know, did not have any problems. You know, in fact, I realized I went for a checkup, my lungs were clean mm. and uh, all functions, all blood tests were normal. All of us did a complete checkup after recovering from COVID. And we did not find anything, uh, you know, unusual. Mm -hmm. Now, from an Ayurvedic perspective, are you suggesting for your clients to be vaccinated for your patients? Yes, Ayurveda was the first medical system in the world, perhaps along with Chinese, to propose vaccination as a method of preventing diseases. When the Britishers came to India, a big vaccination drive was going on against smallpox in India. Mm. You know, inoculation. This predated the discovery of smallpox vaccination by Edward Jenner. Mm. So before the season comes, you know, these uh, local physicians would go around in the villages mm. and inoculate, you know, people, prescribe them diet, and then they will get a mild infection. And then if that is successful, they don't get the disease. But just like today's vaccination, there were some failures, but uh, the accounts of the Britishers who came here, they spoke very highly of the effectiveness of this practice. Mm -hmm. But after the <clears throat> uh, cowpox discovery by Edward Jenner and the 
development of the modern vaccine, this went into disuse. Mm -hmm. It was banned actually when when uh, called the new vaccination was discovered. That was colonial period, of course. They were, you know, subjugating the Indian systems at that time. I just went ahead and started the uh, webinar so that folks can uh, come in and, and kind of get situated. So you'll see them uh, under attendees slowly coming in and we'll start uh, Facebook just a few minutes early also, but feel, feel free to continue uh, the dialogue just as people will yeah, yeah. hear and see. Uh, right, right. No, as far as vaccination is concerned, you know, I wouldn't make a judgment. There are risks, uh, but vaccination is one approach. And we need to take informed decisions, which is very challenging during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, we and and there are there are commercial forces, there are scientific, uh, you know, knowledge, everything mixing together. It's a very delicate situation. Yeah. It's very difficult to take, a, you know, the right decision. So that is perfectly understandable. But I wouldn't dismiss vaccine as totally. You know, we need more science. Maybe per, the the sad fact is that. The good and bad about this vaccines, we will know only retrospectively. Sure. Yeah, because you know, we are living with a pandemic in a very, very unprecedented situation. I don't think such a vaccination drive <clears throat> is uh, was heard of in you know our known recent history. Hmm. So, what are going to be the outcomes? How many of them? Many vaccines, many mechanisms. So it's very difficult to judge. Hmm. And uh, so we all took vaccine shots and I got COVID after vaccine. Yeah, breakthrough case. We're, we're seeing that here in the US now yeah. more and more frequently. They're, they're saying it, the uh, effectiveness drops from like 95% uh, down to the low 80s, high 70s within three or four months, yeah. right? And, and the booster so, isn't even got, available uh, for six months. I got it when my immunity was supposed to be at its peak, hmm. you know, just three weeks. Uh, into wow yeah interesting huh makes you wonder <laughs> and actually my blood markers were not looking good mine alone mm -hmm. and others at whom who were not vaccinated had no problem so it's a bit mm. confusing <laughs> definitely and, and i took a lot of strong ayurvedic medicines um, and then it all came down very quickly but in the beginning my crp was high lactose dehydrogenase which is also a marker indicating a probable, I mean, it's a strong indicator for the uh, severe COVID. I mean, they, they were all rising in the beginning uh, when I had the infection. But then after taking Ayurvedic medicine, three, four days, five days, they all started coming down. It's difficult to judge, uh, you know. Sure. My, my mother was never vaccinated. She's 83, has some comorbidities, but she had absolutely no symptoms. We started Ayurvedic medicine right from the beginning. It's all mixed, so I, I wouldn't make any claims. <laughs> we just try to do the best that's available in a given circumstance. And then I think the limitation of uh, humanity itself is being exposed, of science. Mm -hmm. And it's a humbling experience. Yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. So. The moment to bring my specs at just, sure. just a second. Yeah. Okay, one minute. And if uh, HP comes in, make sure you mute him because there's always a disruption sure. when he's uh, coming in, but uh, he may not be in town. Yeah, he's so I traveling. also just wanted to know uh, how long should I speak? Because we obviously, I guess we need some time for interaction also. Yeah, t t typically um, I'll do a short introduction and then uh, Vladimir will do a more formal introduction to yourself and the topic and and you can feel free to speak 40, 45 minutes, maybe leave 10 or 15 minutes towards the end for questions and answers. We'll, we'll ask them to put their questions in the Q&A box down there. I don't know if you're familiar with the webinars, but there's a little Q&A yeah, box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And then when, when it comes time for Q&A, uh, Vladimir can either read them out or you can pull up the Q&A box and, and select uh, ones that you uh, would like to, to address. So entirely up to you on that format. Okay, so I plan to you know, speak for about 45 minutes. Perfect. And, and oftentimes, depending on the number of questions, we may even go over five or 10 minutes, if that's okay with, uh, with you, um, just, uh, just to make sure we get in as many questions as possible. Um, and uh, we've got some chats. Okay, so we're at 10 uh, o'clock, people are still coming in, but I'm going to go ahead and, and start uh, my recording and uh, make the introductions. So welcome all to uh, New Perspectives. New Perspectives is hosted by our university in Surat, India, and sister organizations, Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center here in Fountain in South Carolina and Surat, India. And I'm Rade, and I'm joined by Vladimir Yatsenko. And of course, with us today is our guest speaker, Dr. Raman Nohar, Director of Research at Amrita School of Ayurveda in India. Welcome. So before today's session, let us join in a few moments of silent contemplation. So concerning ill health and disease, the mother noted in 1971, quote, we are at a moment of transition in the history of the earth. It is merely a moment in eternal time, but this moment is long compared to human life. Matter is changing in order to prepare itself for the new manifestation, but the human body is not plastic enough and offers resistance. This is why the the number of incomprehensible disorders and even diseases is increasing and becoming a problem for medical science." Unquote. So indeed, 50 years later, despite miraculous advances that we've seen in the medical field, the number of disorders and diseases of all types are on the rise. According to the Natural Institute of Health, NIH, nearly half of all Americans suffer from at least one chronic disease, and the number continues to grow. So today, Dr. Ramanohar explores Ayurveda's integral approach to health, which includes not only our physical well-being, but our vital, mental, and spiritual well-being, as well as our state of harmony with the external environment. This Ayurveda approaches disease and ill health from a holistic perspective, an approach for the most part we see lacking in modern Western medicine. In fact, the mother acknowledged this difference in approaches when she said, Holopaths ordinarily cure one thing only to the detriment of another. Ayurvedic doctors rarely have this drawback. This is why I recommend them." Unquote. So in our new perspective webinar today, Dr. Raman Nohar explores Ayurveda's multi-dimensional view of an integral health. And as always, questions will be addressed towards the end of the hour, so we encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time during this talk. With this brief introduction, I'd like to hand it over to Vladimir. Thank you, Radha. Yes. Allow me briefly to introduce our eminent speaker, uh, Vaidya, Dr. Ram Manohar, who received his BA, MS and MD degrees from uh, Bharat 
Bharatiya University, Coimbatore, and uh, Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Bangalore, respectively. He has been contributing to the field of Ayurvedic research since the last 30 years, and I remember we met also in IPI when he was presenting this vision of Ayurveda, which impressed all of us so much, because there was a question of what, what uh, uh, form of um, um, cure would be better, Ayurvedic or allopathic? And there were chosen several cases, the most difficult cases, to compete, as it were. <laughs> and within one year, we can see, and it was acknowledged by the authorities in the US, that uh, Ayurvedic treatment was very effective and even more effective than allopathic. I remember that uh, presentation of yours, and I was very much impressed. And the person who was criticizing Ayurveda is, uh, you know, is something like uh, not effective uh, kind of cheating or voodoo was changing his mind and started to speak that he was actually mistaken and that Ayurveda has its place and power. And there was a big shift in my mind also, my understanding of Ayurveda. And from that time on, of course, uh, um, uh, he has also led many important research studies in Ayurveda for and including landmark studies funded by NIH uh, USA and was awarded excellence in uh, integrative medicine research awarded by European Society of Integrative Medicine. Among the various other awards uh, received by him is Keshav Baliram, uh, head had Gevar uh, healing honor of 2021 for development of Ayurveda in the context of integrative medicine. Uh, he serves also at the, on the task force of Government of India related to Ayush response to COVID-19. And we just discussed before this session the, the issue of this um, virus. Also, he has more than 100 publications to his credit, including research papers in peer-reviewed indexed research journals. He has traveled widely in many countries, including US, uh, Canada, Europe, Russia, Thailand, Singapore, and so on, uh, for the promotion of Ayurveda. So without further ado, I invite Dr. Ram Manohar, to address the audience. Please, Ram. <clears throat> Namaste. Uh, thank you, Vladimir, for that warm introduction. Thank, thank you, Radhe, and all the uh, you know, organizers for this kind invitation. It's a real pleasure and honor to be in, on this platform to share my experiences and what I have learned you know, as a student of Ayurveda and what I'm continuing to learn you know, as a perpetual student of this ancient uh, knowledge system. So let me just share my PowerPoint slide. It's, yeah, I, is it visible now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So today's topic is Ayurveda's multidimensional approach to integral health. So before we get into the topic, I'm just reminded of my school days, you know, when I was a student of Ayurveda, we had before us this motto of WHO, Health for All by 2080. And as a student, I wondered, you know, how can this be? Is health something that can be packaged into a bottle or, you know, uh, a package and then distributed all around the world so that everybody becomes healthy by 2080. I mean, it sounded very unrealistic, but that was the, the objective which we were all looking forward to, you know, as a student at that time. But come 2000, around that time, we had this great epidemic AIDS, you know, and this whole vision was completely destroyed and people were becoming sick and, uh, you know, it was spreading. And then WHO became wiser and we now have a new vision of universal health coverage. And we cannot give 
distribute health to everybody, but we can give health care coverage to all people in the world. But this new COVID-19 pandemic has shown how weak and vulnerable we are. I mean, some of the countries with the access to the most advanced medical facilities reeled, you know, under the impact of COVID-19. So I think the future vision for health is what Ayurveda has always been talking about, health intelligence for all. I mean, health is not something that we can give from the outside. Health is something which every individual has to create by awakening his or her own health intelligence, as Ayurveda calls as pratnya. And this is the most powerful and the most potent medicine. This power of self-transformation that every individual has, unless that is awakened, we are not going to witness a healthy society. I mean, we may have individual miracles, we may have great technological feats, but they are all already too late. I mean, as the Patanjali Yoga Sutra says, Heyam Dukkham Anagadam. I mean, remove the sorrow before it has arrived. And Ayurveda's vision is creation of such a society empowered by what Ayurveda calls as health intelligence. So health intelligence for all, I think the world will awaken to this wisdom. Health for all, to universal health coverage to all, to ultimately health intelligence for all. So Ayurveda's concept of integral health is all about, you know, using our health in intelligence, you know, to cultivate this vision and understanding of what is the human potential. Ayurveda says that we have tremendous potential. It may look at one glance that we are just, you know, a bundle of atoms of matter. But on the other hand, inside this atom, just like in the atom is, you know, hidden enormous physical energy energy, which we have exploited to make bombs and all in positive and negative ways, even deeper inside matter, in matter is a womb of consciousness. And from matter can this great transformation happen, matter can be transformed into a higher expression by awakening and invoking the deeper consciousness that is hidden latently in all human beings. And this, according to Ayurveda, is the ultimate medicine. The ultimate medicine and Ayurveda defines health as this process of self-evolution. I mean, health is not something which is defined in terms of, you know, biochemical parameters. All those are helpful. But health is something, a state to which we have to evolve. Health is not, in modern medicine, it's, we call this as homeostasis, you know, keeping everything as it is. Ayurveda says, no, it is homeodynamics. You know, moving from the present state to a higher state of greater stability, of greater ability, and of greater a greater power of expression. That is what we have to achieve through Ayurveda. So with this introduction, I would like to get into our topic today. And I want to give this first concept of our talk is the Arogya Samskriti of Bharata. The, this is this has been so ingrained in our culture. It is not just from Ayurvedic textbook that we get this wisdom. It was, you know, the entire civilization of India was infused with this vision. So what was created was the Arogya Samskriti, the health culture of ancient India. And we see this not just in the Ayurvedic textbooks, but everywhere. And now I would like to give this definition of integral health, which everybody is familiar. This is, you know, not from Ayurveda. Integral health is a state of being in which the individual's body, the physical, emotions, and life energies, the vital, the thoughts, the mental, are in harmony with our innermost self, the soul. Absence of such harmony manifests as disease or illness. Now, this is for a student of Ayurveda, almost like a translation of Sushruta's definition of health. You know, I was very awestruck when I read this in. One, I think uh, when I was in IPI or somewhere, I came across this definition for the first time. And I was stuck by that similarity uh, of this understanding in Ayurveda. So we'll explore that a little bit more soon. So knowledge and of health, you know, Sanskrit literature is a 
a very rich resource of the wisdom related to health. They are profound and not only in Ayurvedic literature. So I, I will not take much time here, just five minutes, just to give a quick glimpse of what we have as a heritage and how much remains unexplored. You know, thousands and thousands of medical manuscripts are there. I think India has one of the richest collection of medical manuscripts in the world. And less, I mean, at least 90% of this has not yet been studied. You know, they are languishing in manuscript libraries. So this is such a pitiable state. In, we have lost the scholarship. And this is, this is a very basic slide. I don't want to, it's not intended to be described. It's just, you know, symbolic. These are the number of texts, non-Ayurvedic texts in which there is information about Ayurveda. You know, some, it seems to outnumber. And a lot of Ayurvedic knowledge is incomplete when you see the text, because the texts expected that we were familiar with the general research. A lot of Ayurveda was supposed to be learned from non-Ayurvedic literature. So when you look at the wisdom of Ayurveda, I have always felt that it is like trying to fix a jigsaw puzzle. You know, bits and pieces scattered everywhere. Even the, in, in my younger days, the older generation, the grandma, there were unwritten, just spoken words, unspoken words. The whole knowledge of Ayurveda is scattered, you know, in that mental world of what constituted Indian civilization. A lot of it is still in the thought world. And many of it got, you know, inscribed into manuscripts, were preserved. A lot of it was transmitted through oral traditions. But what we know or what we have today uh, you know, what we have salvaged is only a fraction of this wisdom. I wanted to, you know, just put things in perspective that there's still a lot of exploration to be done. Like, you know, I, it is in Mahabharata that, that a deeper understanding of the Tridoshas are mentioned, that Shita, Ushna, and Vayu, not Vata, Pitaka. So they are telling that these are not physical things. They are actually indicating you know, the self-regulatory principles of the body. This is seen only in Mahabharata. In Ayurvedic texts, we translate it as wind, bile, and phlegm. And at that point, everything is lost. The whole understanding of Tridoshas is lost because of the translation. So how the body and mind balances through the interplay of the Trigunas and the Tridoshas is so beautifully depicted in the Mahabharata. And in a few slides, I just want to show that what, when we look at Ayurveda, we are dealing with a very, very dynamic tradition. Now, this is just a representation of the Ayurveda codification of Ayurvedic knowledge that has happened across the geographical regions of India. If I were to put all the manuscripts, you know, on top of this map, we wouldn't see India because they cover completely the whole length and breadth of India. From every nook and corner of our country, you know, people contributed to the development of the knowledge of Ayurveda. So it was a people's movement. And in Ayurveda, we said even the folk knowledge, listen to even a common man. I mean, we don't know from where valuable knowledge can come. Even listen to the animals. The whole knowledge of Ayurveda is built from mother nature. The first lessons we learned by observing animals. In the Atharva Veda, it is said the, the mongoose knows the medicine. The eagle knows the medicine. The boar knows the medicine. Let it come to me for my health. And so this is a very open knowledge system. They were looking at nature in wonder, Ascharyavat. And out of that wonder, from every source, every breath that life produced, you know, that ex experience was infused to create this knowledge system. That is why we call it Ayurveda. It is the breath of life itself. You know, what life experience. It is the experience of life, the sum and substance of life what was experienced over millennia that has been codified in the form of Ayurveda. And you can see the timelines. At every critical time period, the knowledge was updated. I mean, it's not that we are looking at one Charaka Samhita or Sushruta Samhita from 5,000 or 3,000 years ago and, you know, just reciting it like a parrot. There was intense intellectual activity, intense exchange of knowledge, debates, discussions, and it is a result of the sharing, mutual sharing of experience sustained 
over generations that is available today in the form of Ayurveda. So I thought this is very important to say. I mean, uh, when you look at the source, a lot of things that is unexplored and so many names. There was a Dutch scholar called Muhlenbel who made a list of all the big names associated with Ayurveda. So it's not one man's work. It's a work of thousands and thousands of great scholars, physicians, clinicians, and we could, if we could call them researchers, people who were investigating, all of them put their brains together to create this tradition of Ayurveda. And the books are extremely, extremely structured. You know, just like today, if you want to write a scientific publication, you have a formatting. There are different ways you write a original research article with a case report or a clinical trial. There are guidelines. You have a consort guideline, care guideline on how to do that. In Ayurveda, we had also different uh, methods of codifying texts. In fact, Ayurveda contributed to the whole scientific literature of India, the methods and techniques of you know, structured technical writing. This were called as Tantra Yuktis. A technical writing was distinguished from you know, general literature. You had to use certain technical terms. You had to define. You had to be very precise the way you format it. So Charaka Samhita says, you must have an abstract, and you must have a body of the text, and then you must have a conclusion. Supranida Sutra Bhashya Sangraha Kramam. So this format of a research paper where you present it as an abstract, and then you have a body where you explain in detail, and then finally you have a conclusion is first discussed in the Charaka Samhita. There are methods on how you do debates. So this is just to give a flavor of, you know, the intellectual activity and the great scholarly efforts, not only just scholarly, I mean, also experiential exchange, codification, all this has resulted, uh, you know, in what we understand as Ayurveda today. And some of the, and a lot of it was also orally transmitted. I mean, there was a saying in India that Sahasramada, speak as much as you want. Ega malika malika, don't write a single thing unless you're sure. So what was written became sacred because only what was really, really verified and validated would be written down. So nonsense can be spoken, but only sense can be written. That was their concept. So texts were updated very, very carefully. So there was a lot of knowledge that was circulating in the oral tradition. And when they all get, get you know, distilled and verified, then they would get updated. So a writing of an Ayurvedic text was considered a sacred process because out of the knowledge that was circulating, only the most distilled essence would be written down. Of course, in those days, they did not have the facility technology for printing, but their minds worked much better. I mean, they could memorize, you know, uh, content which are kind of mind-boggling if we think today. Even in our uh, younger days, we have heard of people who could just listen to a speech in any language and they would reproduce it. I mean, their minds were extremely working like computers. I mean, today we have to use calculators, computers, tools outside. We do the same computations, uh, you know, with such speed and precision using machines, but many of these ancient and you know these acharyas they had tremendous mental capacity so we cannot undermine them just because they wrote in some old palm leaves and manuscripts uh, i mean their minds worked really very fast and that's how this knowledge was created and we have also so i want to say in ayurveda we have a flavor of science and spirituality this is a very important aspect of ayurveda also that this world and the world hereafter ubhayam this world and the world, we have to embrace both together. So Ayurveda is not talking about an escape from this world. It is talking about a liberation. It's talking about, you know, transforming our, the experience of this world and elevating it to a higher level. I think this is a very, very important aspect of Ayurvedic philosophy because it is a medical science, because it deals with the pain and the suffering of the human being in confronting disease. So Ayurveda is not against any kind of technology. This is very, very important. Many people ask me, uh, yeah, we also already had this discussion of vaccination. So I want to say 
Ayurveda talked about all kinds of technologies. No technology was taboo. You know, we said, if you want extra uterine fertilization, if that's the only way, try it. There are experiments. This may be science fiction, but I want to tell that it's not, I'm not claiming that all these happened in those days, but the fact that these are discussed shows the attitude. I mean, we are not against technology. I'm coming into the spiritual aspects of Ayurveda, but I thought it's very important to show that Ayurveda is not against science. Ayurveda is not against, you know, uh, materialistic approaches to treatment, but it emphasizes, it puts things in balance. And that, that I think is the beauty of the integral approach of Ayurveda. So we have in our tradition stories of what, what we can call today as extra uterine gestation. I think such issues were considered when were you know, subject to many religious debates in many other cultures at this time in Ayurveda, in our tradition, these were all openly accepted surrogate mothers, how the fetus can be influenced externally, even asexual uh, reproduction, re preserving dead bodies, reviving the dying with special herbs, and many, many, many such concepts are there. We have also in Ayurvedic texts, we don't know whether they really happened or whether they were science fiction, but discussions about artificial limbs, head transplant, artificial denture, eye transplants. So Ayurveda is not against technology. It says, let this all be there, but we shouldn't use them. What Ayurveda says is technology should be like a, you know, fire engine or, you know, a fire extinguisher. Keep it, but make sure you never use it. I'm sure we, we would never want to use the fire extinguishers in our room, but we should keep it in case of an emergency. That is the Ayurvedic approach to technology. We don't want to miss anything. If it is really needed, we can use all of this. But Ayurveda shows us a way where we don't become dependent on these external tools, where we liberate ourselves. The whole concept of Ayurveda is Amritatva, liberating, becoming free, you know, from all external limitations by rediscovering your inner self in your own consciousness. And that state of health is called a swasthyam. Swasthyam means to be in oneself. This is the Ayurvedic definition of health. And here Ayurveda, Yoga, Vedanta, everything merges into, you know, one unified vision. So that is why we say Ayurveda is the fifth Veda. Because Vedas talk about that higher vision. And if you are lost in a lower plane, you, have, you cannot, you know, liberate yourself. Ayurveda comes down. If you are sick, it's okay. We are very practical. If you need a uh, transplant okay let's do the transplant save your life and then you know think about the higher thing that that is never lost that vision is never lost and i think linking when you're talking about the integral vision of ayurveda linking the spiritual material dimension of human consciousness i think that's the first level at which ayurveda integrates life into one complete whole there are also research myths, the questioning attitude. It's not that all Ayurvedic knowledge was discovered by a rishi sitting close with his eyes in meditation. And then a light, you know, uh, brightens up in his mind and everything is known. It was done through painful exploration. Sushruta tells not just India, Nadishu Shaili, Shu Sarasuchabi, explore the whole earth to find out, you know, medicines. The rivers, the waters, the oceans, the mountains, the plains, villages, wherever there is a piece of land, wherever there is even water, wherever the Panjabhunga Buddhas are there, there is some medicine. So this is again an open system that Ayurveda is very open and inquisitive. And there were also ancient attempts at creating, you know, Ayurveda describing in, with uh, diagrams you know, schematic diagrams of human anatomy. And so this is what I think for me is most fascinating. This whole panorama, this whole inclusiveness, on the one hand, taking you to the heights of, you know, spiritual awareness and consciousness and at the same time, bringing you down to the ground reality of, you know, pain and suffering. I think this is quite a task to be able to reconcile these two viewpoints. And that is where I think Ayurveda has a great, uh, you know, vision to offer. 
in ayurveda we study ayurveda by viewing childbirth not by dissecting a dead body and ayurveda says we shouldn't start studying medicine by dissecting a dead body which has no life you have to see according to ayurveda shariram is seeing how the mic macrocosm becomes the microcosm that's the first step in understanding you know learning medicine not what remains after the consciousness is gone so ayurveda is very careful don't look at a dead body first look at what is life and i was listening to a viewing a serial called mentalist and suddenly there is a dialogue it's an american serial where they say the mentalist is saying he finds a doctor and he says this is a fake doctor he's an imposter because he has compassion in today's medical education it's impossible to have compassion like this so he's not trained in a medical school because the moment you join medical school a dead body is thrown in front of you and then a pile of you know technical writing and there you lose your humanity in ayurveda we start the study of medicine by looking at how a new life is created we start by witnessing the miracle of the creation of new life how the elements in the macrocosm come together and create the magic of new life how does that consciousness manifest you know when all these physical materials combine that test tube the, the the test tube of nature you know the womb of the woman from which life emanates i mean we start studying ayurveda by worshiping that that womb from which life emerges and this womb in ayurveda is called shankha it's a conch shankha means shamkha sham means auspicious come in space so the womb is auspicious space where the energies of shiva and shakti unite at the physical level to create new life and that life is going to there are two shankhas in the human body one is the uterus which is like a conch if you look at the shape of the the female uterus and the whole genitalia we can see that it is like a conch the other conch is the skull in puja when we keep the worship we keep the skull it represents you know our human skull and the water inside that is amrita jala which is the fame amrita jala of the yogis so in two places the shiva shakti samagama has to happen and in ayurveda we witness the union of shiva and shakti to spark the creation of life and that reminds us the ultimate goal of that, that individual is to unite his own shiva and shakti here and elevate you know himself to a higher level of consciousness and this is the medicine that we learned you know as students of ayurveda and the dead body so that is the end and the body that death is not an end in the indian tradition we never worried about whether there is god or not we we have two darshanas astika nastika i think we were very very pragmatic very clever nobody asked whether god exists or not the whole question was whether i will exist after death or not if i exist then it matters whether god exists so they were very pragmatic astika means asti paraloka iti there are people who said that we survive i mean our individuality survives death they were called as astikas and those who said the end of the body is the end of our existence they were called as nastikas as so very often astika nastika is translated as theist and atheist and this is completely misleading there is no theism and atheism in that sense there is only whether i exist and i am the self i am the universe ultimately that's what we are realizing atma is brahman itself so it's all a question of me discovering my source that's how the whole equation comes on ayurveda tells us why an astika darshanam is helpful how it can elevate us to that higher level of consciousness so ayurveda is an astika darshanam it it believes or it and there is a big debate whether paraloka exists or not and ayurveda tries to and prove it scientifically by talking about you know regression memories jati smarana where yogis in a particular state can you know actually uh, see their previous births so it tries to give even empirical evidence in support of you know uh, acceptance of a previous life and tells that 
you if you, even if you cannot believe it try to realize it through the practice of yoga it's worth attempting to see whether paraloka exists or not because it can completely transform your view and perspective on life so this whole concept of dharma is there because of paraloka if there is no paraloka there is no dharma because everybody lives only one life and there can be no dharma nurtured if we don't conceive of paraloka so that is a very very important concept in ayurveda and it is through the concept of paraloka that ayurveda tells us it says this ihaloka cannot be denied it's a it's a reality it's a very concrete experience for us but by taking us our vision to the paraloka it tells us why we must embrace spirituality why we must evolve into a higher level of consciousness now the, the philosophy of ayurveda as arogya darshan so we have arogya samskriti in india and that arogya samskriti comes from the darshan arogya darshan of ayurveda it is a translation of the arogya darshan in social life in in the whole entire fabric of the society when this got translated it became arogya samskriti so now the tridoshas i think i just want to tell a little bit about this because even the tridoshas have the spiritual dimension tridoshas are actually self regulatory principles of the body they are not three substances they are actually patterns of variation if you take today physiology is continuously changing nothing is static but those variations create a pattern you know the body is continuously shifting like a pendulum we know our blood sugar increases then it stabilizes then it decreases increases stabilizes decreases everything in the body is moving through this pendulum of increase and decrease and you know coming in the center and this balance is what in modern science it is called as you know homeostasis but ayurveda tells that this is not static it is evolving or it is devolving i mean you can go down to a lower level of health or you can elevate it to a higher level of stability which is called as dosha samyam so dosha samyam is what we have to work for we you know enhance and uh, empower our own self regulatory system so that it works at a higher level of efficiency whereas the whole focus of modern medicine is just to keep it balanced you know if something is missing you add that if a blood pressure goes up you force it down but ayurveda says that's not the way you have to elevate you have to transcend not just work at what level it is functioning bring it to a higher level of functionality and that there is an entire higher branch of ayurveda called as rasayana which aims so this was a concept also that unless you elevate your body to a higher level of functioning you cannot pursue a higher life they have it transform your physical body to something more powerful so that it can receive it can withstand you know the descent of your consciousness because now it is not capable and that that is why we are not conscious as our physical body evolves the descent of the consciousness um, because in ayurveda we call it as avatarana it is symbolic something which is not within our reach we say is higher and bringing it within our reach is kind of a descent so the preparation of the body for the transformation and manifestation of a higher consciousness that is the goal of ayurvedic treatment not just merely moving disease and it is in that way so when we completely work on the configuration of our tridoshas and the trigunas in the mind to the point where we get this change in the physical body at that point a higher consciousness manifests and then you become a swastha so that moment we don't know when it will happen we have to keep working for it it just one moment is needed for this transformation to occur but it may take lifetimes of effort before before you are prepared this is what ayurveda says so in the charaka samhita there is a statement what will happen if you take rasayana na kevalam dirgham ha yurashnute not just long life rasayanam yo vidhiman nishevate one who does this rasayana regimen in their life which consists of lifestyle mindset you know herbs food everything together it's a complex regimen for self transformation for this 
preparation for something higher when you do that successfully gatimcha gatimsa devarshya nishevitam they become they transform themselves into rishis they become rishis when this physical transformation happens so this is a very important concept in ayurveda that without preparing your physical body for this higher evolution for this transformation it's difficult to, to reach there because it's a higher vital force that is trying to occupy our physical body it's not it ready for it it will explode it will get destroyed so it has to happen just through stages step by step the preparations so from a very physical level and this is what ayurveda talks about as you know personalized medicine each individual the, the goal is the same but we are all our starting points are all different and this is the formula most of the vedas vedantas they talk about the goal but they don't talk about the starting point and if we try to jump we will be destroyed because we have to create the road map from where we stand and that is the insight that ayurveda gives us which we call as the prakriti of an individual no two individuals are alike i have my own unique prakriti and i have to work it's like my fingerprint and for each person there is a user manual or a road map my road map which nobody else can follow that path and the goal of ayurveda is to open that user manual for us ayurveda is like a mirror you look at ayurveda and you see yourself we i will see myself we all see ourselves first it is telling you who you are and why you are who you are so let's love ourselves let's know that there's nobody else like me in this world i am unique and my journey is unique and that is why we say that ayurveda is person centered medicine this path of self evolution and self transformation is laid out through this concept of prakriti and a big aspect of ayurveda and once we understand our prakriti we can regulate our doshas and the trigunas in the mind more effectively and bring about this inner transformation so this is the definition of health in ayurveda which is very similar to the concept of integral health when the doshas are in balance physically when the digestion and metabolism becomes efficient and the body systems work optimally and excretion of waste is promptly executed on such a firm physical foundations the senses the mind and the self are established in blissful existence so they all support each other and the highest vitality is manifested so what ayurveda tells us is that our bodies are immensely capable and we are using them only to the fraction of their capability we can elevate ourselves to a much much higher level of experience and existence and in ayurveda we have this concept you know what we distinguish was always the atman and the anatman not the body and the mind there is a lot of question whether the mind is uh, physical or you know is it something uh, beyond the body in ayurveda we had no doubt we said the food affects the mind you can change the functioning of your mind by giving some chemicals ayurveda used medicines the mind and the body create one continuum it is part of prakriti mind is material it is not yourself in fact knowing that your mind is not yourself is a very important uh, you know step in self discovery so the mind is part of the body and so we have no problems with neurologists if you cut your brain then your mind may you know you cannot see your mind because this is so integrally connected there was a debate in the upanishads whether the mind is separate from the body and the rishi says stop eating food and come back after a few days and then tell me whatever you studied and the students were not able to remember anything and then the rishi said annamayam hi saumyam mana see your mind is made out of the food that you eat are you convinced now so it's material 
it's much more subtle, but it's still material. And there is a, so in Ayurveda, we say the mind, it's like the ghee and the iron pot. You hate heat either one of them, the other gets heated. This crosstalk between the body and the mind is a very interesting, important theme in Ayurveda. We say, don't separate the body and the mind. Think of them as one. What you think has an impact on your body and what the, happens in the body has an impact on your mind. And here I would like to, you know, I, this has been very fascinating for me because Sri Aurobindo, even in his absence, inspired the discovery of a molecule which came to be known in Sanskrit. There is only one molecule in chemistry, I think, name, given a Sanskrit name, and that is called Anandamide. And the, the scientist who discovered this, you know, he was in Aurobindo Ashram. He was there for some time and there he got a vision because there was a discovery that there are receptors for endocannabinoids in the human brain, in the body. So the scientists were wondering, I mean, where are these cannabinoids coming from? Why is there a receptor? It means the body is also drugging itself. This was a very interesting question. And they said that this could be what we, we can name as a bliss molecule. And there were many scientists trying to, you know, running race, you know, to discover this first. And this scientist from Israel, I don't remember his name, he came to Aurobindo Ashram and stayed there for some time. And he got a vision that he's the one who's going to discover this. He got a premonish. And in that moment, he named that new molecule, even before it was discovered, as Ananda Mind or the bliss molecule with out of respect for Sri Aurobindo. And four years later, it, it was indeed he who discovered this molecule. And he kept his promise. He called it as Ananda Mind, the bliss molecule. If you run every day in the morning, the bliss molecule is produced in abundance in your body. So what you do with your physical body affects your mind. And so tuning, calibrating your body and mind so that you can allow the manifestation of a higher consciousness. This doesn't mean that your self is ananda mind. This is all about calibrating your body and mind. There are so many physical chemical reactions that have to happen in this platform of the body and mind before a higher consciousness can manifest and you know uh, express itself in all its glory. And that is what Ayurveda is you know all about. I think I will stop in the next five minutes. I just think I have reached about 45 minutes. There were many, many more slides, but this is never ending. So a few more concepts and then I will discuss. Is that okay? Yeah. So this new modern concept about the PNEI axis, I won't say they are exactly the same, but it's a model, it's a, it's a biochemical understanding of the Ayurvedic model of the Tridoshas and the mind. Ayurveda said mind, vata, pitta, and kapha. And the mind also, sattva, rajas, tamas. This is the whole axis of the body and mind. And today, modern science is talking about PNEI axis, psycho, neuro, endocrino, immunological axis. And there is a continuous crosstalk across this axis. And if you really look at the meanings of vata, pitta, kapha, you know, vata is more related to neurological regulation neurological regulation of the body. Pitta is related to endocrinological regulation and kapha to the immunological regulation. I'm not saying they're exactly same, but these are small bridges that you can bridge, you know, create between two knowledge systems. And suddenly, you know, we realize many things, ideas about the heart also being a brain, heart brain. Today, modern science is talking about Neurons in the heart, the gut brain, neurons in the gut. These are, you know, ancient concepts rediscovered that the mind and the body are intimately connected, not just at the brain brain, but I think tomorrow we are going to discover skin brain also. According to Ayurveda, the skin is also a brain because our touch is such a powerful way of communication. And there are so many things that you can convey through the touch, gut feeling, you know, what you experience in the heart. Even today, when I say I, I put my hand over my heart, not on my head, because this is where self-awareness is concentrated. And there is an anatomy of the heart that when the blood moves out of the 
a heart, you know, the heart attack itself is a paradox. It's penury amidst plenty. The heart is full of blood when it suffers a myocardial infarction. If there was some way for the heart muscles to take the blood directly from where it contains, there wouldn't be heart attack at all. The reason is that the heart is the seat of self because the heart is the yatna according to Ayurveda. It is the prana pradishta. That is where the self, swayambhu is there, the sinoatrial uh, node from which you know the, the impulse comes. It's like a swayambhu. The heart is existing for the whole body. So it's very interesting that heart symbolizes the concept of yatna in Ayurveda. And anatomy, modern anatomy also confirms it. When the blood moves out of the aorta, you know, the aortic valve closes the, en the entry into the coronary arteries. The heart cannot receive blood when it is pumping it to the rest of the body. When the backflow comes and the aortic valve closes, after distributing everything to the rest of the whole body, what comes back trickles down the coronary arteries and the heart muscle receives. This is what Bhagavad Gita calls as yatna shishta. The heart is a symbol of the biggest yatna that is happening in our own body. The heart is giving to the rest of the body and takes only what remains. And when heart attack is nothing but the selfishness of the rest, it is a bhanga of the yatna. And this is why Ayurveda says that disease is the anger of Lord Shiva. It is the destruction of the yatna of Daksha. So, what we see in Ayurveda is this integration of what is physical and, you know, what is transphysical. A very beautiful synthesis giving us this higher vision of, you know, life. So the last point I would like to say, and there were many other slides, but I think this is where we will conclude. Yeah, one, one other slide I wanted to show was how in our creation, you know, this integration of multiple elements. We say this is Prakriti. How is Prakriti formed? There are, how are we, our individuality is created? You know, it comes from multiple sources. Ethnicity, the community in which we are born, family, the place, the time, age, and then the individual components, the tridoshas and trigunas. So if you were to translate this into a modern perspective. What Ayurveda is telling is that our, our individuality is an expression of what we carry, you know, from our deep inner source and that which is modulated by genetics and epigenetics. All these three things together create the dynamic person that we are. So I want to say this, when you say integral, Ayurveda has been integrating, you know, multiple dimensions to create a more complete view of the human being. And the last point that I would like to highlight is uh, yes, about Ayurveda is first and foremost nature centric and then only person centric. And this is the total vision that we are part of this complete universe. Ayurveda says that Satya Buddhi, or you are healthy when you feel that you are part of the entire creation. The creation is in you and you are in creation. So you cannot be healthy until the entire creation is in harmony. And that is why Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Vashyantu, Ma Kaschit Dukkha Bhag Bhave. When every you know, every point in this whole creation is bubbling in harmony, expressing that highest consciousness. That is when there will be health in this universe. And that is the aspiration of Ayurveda. And that is what we call as a complete integral vision. Om Purnamada Purnamidam, Purnat Purnamudachade, Purnasya Purnamadaya, Purnameva Vashishyate. So it is that whole, you know, unless we bring that complete vision, I mean, COVID is today, I think, a, a, a great teacher. If there was a great best teacher award to be given in this times, it would go to COVID because it is teaching us how 
important it is for us to look inside, how important it is for us to, you know, uh, repair, mend our ways. Uh, nature was healing during the pandemic. Nature is healing itself. It is not a punishment. COVID is not a punishment. It is just the result of our interactions with the external world. And so Ayurveda tells us that a wholesome interaction with the external universe, that is the cause of health and disease. Kalartha karmanam yogo hina mithyadi matraga. What you think in your mind, how you act with the external environment, that is ultimately going to determine whether we are going to have you know, a healthy existence or not. And we are collectively responsible for it. Unless we bring this collective wisdom, unless we awaken with this higher health intelligence, I think there is no future for humankind. And, uh, but there is, of course, nature is compassionate. And it, I think we will go through all those experiences that will transform us into this higher awakening and realization. And for this reason, Ayurveda remains. Ayurveda is not against modern medicine. Ayurveda embraces modern medicine, but just tells us that we may need to go beyond. We need to not limit ourselves to curative medicines. It's like living with crippled, like a crippled person with crutches. Ayurveda wants us to be free and to be not dependent and to elevate ourselves to a higher level of being and existence. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ram Manohar. That was a beautiful, inspirational talk. <laughs> and it is exactly what we were expecting to, to give us an overview, a bigger picture of Ayurveda, to see if all it in integral vision of the whole nature. And this uh, attitude, which I notice, um, it is coming from the Veda, yeah? from the Rig Veda. It's a Vedic vision of uh, nature first, the spirit first. The nature is embodiment of the spirit. And we are all the elements of this. And we have to respect this movement. And our health, this uh, idea of what you presented that, uh, you know, homeodynamics of Ayurveda is a beautiful new idea. And not the homeostasis that you have to find something which is statically good for you in this moment of time. And this is the problem of all statistics, because statistics is something which caught in time in that moment. And then you compare with that moment, everything else which is already evolving, it should not fit to that statistical point. It should deviate from it. But how? How this idea of dynamic truth, which is in the Veda, this coming back to the dynamic truth, to rhythm, where everything can express the highest truth in this moment of time. It is possible. It's, um, it is assured by Ayurvedic concepts which you were presenting today. It is beautiful. So we have few questions here. And uh, uh, unless um, Radhe would like to say she is actually Ayurvedic practitioner and studied Ayurveda and published several books, I would invite Radhe to make some comments. Sure. Thank, thank you, Vladimir. I actually um, have, a, have a question for you, Dr. Ramanohar. Um, you had mentioned uh, a number of the sages that have contributed to the knowledge of Ayurveda, Charika, Shushruta, Kashyapa, etc. Um, what I didn't hear you mention is the Atarva Veda and, and its role and, uh, and source of Ayurveda. So I'd be very interested. I know uh, Charika mentions that of all the Vedas, the Atarva Veda is the one that each Ayurvedic physician should know. And could you explain a little bit about the relationship between the Atarva Veda and Ayurveda uh, per the classics? Right. You know, this is a very symbolic uh, correlation. If you look at the Vedas, the four Vedas, they are, you can divide them into two, two groups. One is the Trai. The Rik, Yajus, and Sama are called as the Trai. They make one complete composite whole. And Atharva Veda actually stands out. It's the Veda of Prayaschitta. It is the remedial Veda of Veda of compensation. 
Now, these three Vedas actually represent the three faculties that we have, Icha Shakti, Jnana Shakti, and Kriya Shakti. That is the power of will, Icha Shakti, the desire, you know, our resolve, Sankalpa, which is the Rig Veda, Riches Tutau. It is expressing our highest aspirations, our highest emotions. That is what we express through the Rig Veda. And Yajur Veda is Karma, Yajus standards, uh, you know, uh, stands for action, karma. That is the Kriya Shakti. And Sama Veda is for Jnana or knowledge, Sami Karuti, the, the equal vision. So what Veda says, Soma Yaga actually means bringing the three faculties together, you know, in harmony, our Icha Shakti, Jnana Shakti and Kriya Shakti. So with the highest motivation, and with the perfect knowledge, when I perform an action, when I respond to the universe, I'm leading a Vedic life. You know, I achieve the highest. So bringing together these three, this is what is Vedic life. You know, uh, this is the Soma Yaga that we are expected to do. And when we fall from that, Atharvati, not Tharvati, forces you back into this harmony. That is Atharva Veda. And this is, is happening when this harmony is lost. So because Atharva Veda is the Veda of Prayas Chittam or the Veda of compensation, that is why Ayurveda is part of Atharva Veda. There is also a view that Ayurveda is part of Rig Veda because what Ayurveda says is that emotional purity is also the foundation of health. So for preventive health, Ayurveda traces itself to Rig Veda and for curative health, Ayurveda traces itself to Atharva Veda because Atharva Veda tells us how to go back to that Somayaga, how to rediscover that Pratnya, in what Ayurveda calls as that health intelligence is nothing but tracing our way back to that Vedic, uh, you know, way of existence. This is a very quick way, uh, quick answer to your question. We can also, there are also other more, uh, you know, practical and other connections in terms of the content, but I think that would be quite a long topic to discuss, you know, about the herbs that came from that, techniques that came, and we can also look into that from a scholarly point of view, but I was just trying to look at it in a more insightful manner. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, may I say one word on this, because it's a, it's a, it's a new thing for me also, because when I studied uh, Agnihotra, if you study Agnihotra, you see in uh, Aitareya Brahmana how it is described, the whole ritual. So there are three fires, there are three priests, belong to three Vedas, they making oblation into three fires. And there is one priest, which is called Brahman, who belongs to Atharva Veda, actually, who doesn't have the fire, but who observes what others are doing, and does prayashittam in his mind. Yeah? He makes a correction. Correction where the mistake was done there, something neglection was done there. He puts everything into the harmonious uh, action of three different elements of heaven, space in between heaven and earth, and earth. He combines them together in harmonious oneness in his mind. And when Dakshina is distributed for all the priests, the half of the uh, Dakshina is given to three priests, yeah, to Hotar, Udgatar, and Advaryu, these who were doing oblations into three fires, and one half of it to Brahman. So uh, Aitareya asks, why is that so? Brahman didn't do anything, didn't speak, didn't do oblation. <laughs> But he was representing the mind which combined all and actually cured and made sacrifice possible. This curing prayashittam action. And that makes sense what you were mentioning now with prayashittam. Just developing this thought again for myself. Thank you. Thank you for this insight. Yeah, that's, that's what a fascinating account. I mean, yeah, that really confirms <laughs> the Ayurvedic perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, there are three questions here, if I may read them to you. Um, 
So there is one question, it's from the beginning, it, it is not related to the immediate start, uh, discussion. Namaste, I would like to hear a little bit about remote pulse d diagnosis. Dot Nadi Pariksha. I experienced uh, this exciting and incredible process with Dr. Mahesh Krishnamurti Bangalore and would like to understand more on this. What you have I have to, yeah, th thank you for that question, but I have to express my helplessness here because there are many, many subtle methods and techniques. In fact, even Nadi diagnosis is today not possible except by very few individuals because there are, as I said, there are many deep skills that Ayurveda physicians developed, which, uh, you know, perhaps compensated for the absence of technology. They are higher sensibilities and sensitivities, which according to Ayurveda can be developed only by tapas, not by, you know, college training or learning. It is through tapas and transformation of the mind that you get abilities like, you know, uh, Dutta Nadi Pariksha. Even Nadi Pariksha requires tremendous mental skills. You know, it's like you're converting your touch sensation you know, they are becoming sensors. You're able to identify patterns. I've spent time with Nadi experts and I've seen that this is possible and you feel fascinated, but it's not easy to learn. And today, so we don't have many experts in this field. Uh, Ayurvedic texts say that, you know, Ayurveda emerged from Indra. Indra is a sahasraksha, means somebody who has a thousand eyes. So we have two eyes, Indra has thousand eyes. So when you become an Indra, you're able to do things that you cannot just do with two eyes. But to become an Indra, you have to do, you have to become a Shatakradu, you have to do a hundred Yagas, and then you become an Indra. So that tapas is not there in our life today. We are living as bogies. I mean, we are in, involved in sensory enjoyment. And then we lo lose, I mean, we don't get these higher uh, mental capabilities. When that is there, Charaka says, you know, you think of a person and you can know what, what he's suffering from. <laughs> That's possible. That was how diagnosis was made. But today, I mean, we don't have it. So even Ayurveda, it's not there in the Ayurvedic training. So whoever you met and if you think he, I mean, he has that ability, I would say that they are very rare individuals. And you have to be very careful not to be taken for a ride. I would think twice before accepting anybody's Nadi analysis, or I would really want to know what is their background, how authentic they are. It is possible, but very difficult. So if you find such individuals, that's great. Mm, thank you. So there is another question. So is there a place for endocanana voids? I don't know what it right. is. In the recovery of an out of balance body. You know, one day, uh, once uh, Sadhguru was mentioning, uh, it's a very nice conversation. We were in uh, Harvard and he was asked this question and he was telling, you know, I need to be always in a high. I mean, because that whole discussion there was about drug abuse and deaths and whether Ayurveda can help in the overuse of opioids. So this is a human need. I mean, the body is self-designed. We produce a lot of neurochemicals of happiness just by changing our behavior. If we run, mm -hmm. if we exercise, if we do yoga, GABA, there is another molecule that is produced. There is serotonin when we adjust our diet and when we have certain kinds of behavior, goal setting, then serotonin is produced in our system. Our body is a chemical factory of all ingredients that are needed to keep us happy. In fact, we are doing that consistently to recover, you know, from the pain and challenges of life. And if you bring all these practices into your life, this Ayurveda calls as Sadvritta, which includes how you are going to, you know, think, how you are going to conduct your activities in your day. If you harmonize that, the body has all the ingredients that is necessary. It's a big pharmacy in itself. Even painkillers are there. Anti-anxiety medicine is there. You know, energy boosters, all these chemicals are produced in our own body. And we have only discovered a few of them. 
and this is the difference between ayurveda and modern medicine also in modern medicine we would try to give it from the outside whereas in ayurveda we uh, make the body itself produce it so it definitely all these things have their role in restoring the harmony and balance of the body that is why the body produces it but we have to orchestrate we have to lead a life mm. to, in such a way that all of them you know manifest mm, beautiful thank you and there is one more question how is modern medicine similar to ayurveda what principles of ayurveda are utilized by scientific methods of modern medicine you know the methodology the scientific methods i think are the same ayurveda says that knowledge is you know uh, generated through observation and you have there is this very interesting story of agnivesha one of the disciples of atreya questioning his teacher saying i don't i cannot believe in what you have just said about ayurveda now because i see people are taking ayurvedic medicines and they are dying not recovering and there are people who are not taking ayurvedic medicines and they are surviving so there is no correlation i cannot you know if i go by observation your treatment doesn't seem to be working and now this is how the charaka samhita introduces the disciple a questioning young disciple who wants statistical evidence of whether you know treatments really work by looking at what happens in the population and atreya responds by saying you know some diseases are self limiting they don't need medicine and some even with medicines don't get cured and then what is the role of a physician only treat those diseases which is treatable that's all a physician's role is and there we never fail so he and the charaka brought, brings this concept of chance effect and real effect which is the whole basis of evidence based medicine today you know he says yadrcha siddhi if you cannot establish a cause and effect connection between your treatment and the outcome he says this is yadrcha siddhi accidental effect just because you treated a patient and he got better doesn't mean that it was your treatment that worked daiva vashat natra vaidya roga pramokshe karanam the vaidya is not responsible you know for the cure of the disease it is daiva vashat just accidentally it happened so if it has to really happen then it is called pratinyamiki siddhi p p value of statistics you know is it a real effect or a chance effect so ayurveda was also trying to validate knowledge in this way and in ayurveda we have anumana pratyaksha observe you know study the literature aptopadesha then verify it through pratyaksha and anumana this is the method where is the difference i think it is in the ontology ayurveda accepts what is beyond the physical world also says that that should also be brought into the domain of scientific inquiry in modern medicine everything stops at the point of sensory measurement we have expanded the capacity of our sense organs we have created microscopes instruments but beyond the sense what ayurveda calls as vyaktam vyakta vyaktam and avyaktam reality is has three dimensions the vyaktam which is vyaktam indriyagam sarvam that which is sensory which you can measure through the senses that is only one fraction then there is vyakta vyaktam which is beyond the sense organs and then beyond even the mind there is another dimension to reality and when ayurveda embraced all the three the whole discourse of knowledge changed and modern medicine is just stuck with the vyakta universe it just shuts itself shuts its eyes off just blinding itself to the existence of anything you know beyond that so that is what i think made modern science develop in that way and that is why ayurveda can accept modern science but perhaps not so easy for modern science to accept ayurveda because ayurveda includes all these three domains so it's very easy for us to accept what comes from the vyakta realm but for modern medicine to accept what comes from vyakta vyakta and avyakta is more challenging so beautiful thank you actually it explains also how shri rubindo speaks on uh, the on the medicinal plants he says that you think that it is the the chemicals of the medicinal plants are curing you 
He says, no, it is the idea which is standing behind that medicinal plant which interferes with force and cures and makes the correction. And that is exactly this, uh, Vyakta, Vyakta, and the Vyakta, which is entering into the Vyakta, into the manifested. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Ram Manohar. It was wonderful to have you with us today. And we, uh, we hope we will meet again and we will continue this journey because it's not about only health, it's about the holistic vision, it's a knowledge system which is required. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. For a great honor thank you. Great thank you so much. So here H.P. Rama with us, uh, our Chancellor of our university and uh, head of our Thank project. you. Thank you very much. Very enlightening. Thank you, thank you. It was a great honor and pleasure. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.